Welcome to North Park Stratford. My name is Kirk Earhart and I am the site pastor here and it is a joy to be able to welcome you to our weekend worship service. We hope that our service will bless you and bless your heart uh, and challenge you in your life as we continue to seek Jesus together. Uh, we are very excited for today. We're going to be doing two pretty special things. One is we're going to be celebrating communion together. That's where we're going to take uh, two elements. One's juice, one's bread element. And in that, we're going to remember what Jesus did. And one of our elders from our Fanshawe location, Dennis Ensing and his wife, will be leading us in that later. Also, today marks kind of the one-year anniversary since our very first gathering uh, before anything else was available for North Park Stratford. So today, we're going to look at a year in review. And I'm, I've been really excited about all that God has been doing for the last 12 months in our church and what I believe God wants to keep doing uh, in the city of Stratford through us. So uh, we invite you now to uh, relax, have a cup of coffee, enjoy church service, and yeah, let's do church. Hey friends, welcome back to Kids Church at North Park. I am so glad that you are here. Today is our final week where we are focusing in on faith. Do you remember what faith means? Hmm, we talked about it uh, quite a few weeks ago. Faith is trusting in what you can't see because of what you can see. So let's start today by hearing our memory verse from this month. We had a competition, Parents versus Kids. Who won in your house? Well, I got some special videos. I have four kids that are helping me out this week. See if you recognize them and say the verse along with them. Ephesians 2.8 God's grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. Your salvation doesn't come from anything you do. It's God's gift! Ephesians 2 verse 8 God's grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. Your salvation doesn't come from anything you do. It is God's gift.
So I wonder how well we actually pay attention to the things that are all around us. How well are we focusing on details? Like right now, do you know the color of your front door? Did you guess it right? Okay, without looking, cover your eyes. What color shirt is the person sitting beside you wearing? Did you get that right? Sometimes we think we're focused in and we think we're noticing details, but maybe we don't quite remember them all just so clearly. I thought it might be fun to test our knowledge about things that we see a lot, see how well we're focused in. So you're gonna see them come up on the screen and then you can shout out which one is real and which one is fake. So let's start. Which one of these things is not a type of pop? Is it orange, grape, or broccoli? Hmm, I think I gave you a big hint there. It's broccoli. Broccoli is not a type of pop. Okay, number two. Which of these things is not a type of Oreo? Is it s'mores, watermelon, or dog food? I don't know about you guys. I don't want to try the dog food food flavored Oreos. No, thank you. You're right. Dog food is not correct. Which of these is not a type of Pop-Tart? Frosted cherry, brown sugar, or dirty sock? See, I did it again. I kind of gave you the answer, didn't I? <laughs> With my face. It's dirty sock. Dirty sock is not, definitely not correct. All right. Which of these is not a type of chips? Is it barbecue, dill pickle, or brownie sundae? I don't know about you guys, brownie sundae sounds delicious, but maybe not as a type of pop. Hmm. Okay, last one. Which of these is not a type of M&M? &M? Milk chocolate, peanut, or asparagus? You know, I love asparagus, like the sundaes, but I don't know about an M&M that's flavored like asparagus. In today's story, we're going to take a look at the very last book on the Bible bookshelf, the Book of Revelation. Now, this book was written by a man named John. John was one of Jesus' original disciples. He actually got to spend time with Jesus. Now, this story came after Jesus died, came back to life, and then ascended to heaven. John was taken to a prison colony on the island of Patmos, where people worked in the mine. And he was sent there because he wouldn't stop telling people about Jesus. Now, John lived longer than any of other Je Jesus' other disciples and now he was very old and he was probably gonna live the rest of his days out on this island with criminals. Now something really amazing happened to John while he was on the island and he wrote about it so that we can read about it today. God wanted John to write them down, to share with others so they too could believe. The Bible, it's 66 books of history stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how He created us and loves us so much that He made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 3 to five. John squinted against the blinding glare of the afternoon sun. Just a short distance away, frothy waves crashed against craggy rocks and foamed over white sands. This island of Patmos was isolated and rocky, but the view was stunning, surrounded by brilliant blue sea and sky. Most beautiful prison on earth. Though he wasn't chained up, John was in jail. The Roman emperor who was unable to make John stop preaching about Jesus had exiled him to this prison colony where many prisoners worked in the mines. 
There was no way off the island, so John was now very old, living out his final years on the island of Patmos with a handful of criminals. I can share the story of Jesus with them too. John settled into a shallow cave on shore to take shelter from the heat. He closed his eyes. I've seen so much. John had lived longer than any of the other of Jesus' disciples. He had watched the early church grow while the story of Jesus spread fast and bright as wildfire. But he had also seen terrible things happen to those who believed in Jesus. In fact, many people died just for talking about Jesus. We saw everything Jesus did. We can believe he'll be with us forever, even through death. Despite the threats and persecution, more people than ever were following Jesus. God's story was traveling from one end of the world to the other, just like Jesus said it would. I wonder why I've been allowed to live this long. In the cool of the shallow cave, John began to relax. His head was nodding. Until a voice like a trumpet sounded behind him. Write on a scroll what you see. John blinked. Was he awake or dreaming? Wait, what? Uh, I don't see. Oh. Turning, John saw Jesus himself, his eyes blazing with intensity. Do not be afraid. I was dead. But look, I am alive forever and ever. Write about what is happening now and what will happen later. John's mind worked quickly, trying to grasp what was happening. It appeared that God was trying to show him a picture of things that would happen in the future, and he wanted John to write them down and show them to others so that they could believe too. Yes, Lord. Do you mind if I grab a scroll? Oh, and a quill. I don't want to forget anything. John watched, amazed, as God showed him many things that were coming. Some were wonderful, some were terrible, some were mysterious. After the vision ended, John began a letter to several of the new churches. I, John, am writing this. I am a friend who suffers like you. As members of Jesus' royal family, we can put up with anything that happens to us. John explained every strange and amazing thing he had seen. Some of it made him tremble. Others wouldn't make sense until the right time had come. But the last part of his vision. That's the very best part. I can't wait to write all about it. God had shown John how the whole story will turn out for everyone who believes in Jesus. Carefully, he recalled all the incredible things he'd seen. How am I going to do this? I mean, there's no way that words can capture it. But I have to try. It's just a picture until they get to see for themselves how real and breathtaking it will be. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. John remembered the words that Jesus had spoken while he was on earth, right before his death and return to life. There are many rooms in my father's house. I am going there to prepare a place for you. If I go and do that, I will come back, and I will take you to be with me. Then you will also be where I am. That's what I saw. It's the special place Jesus is making for each one of us. A place where we will never be apart from God. John recalled the next scene from his vision. He saw a great white throne. I heard a loud voice from the throne. It said, now God makes his home with people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sadness. There will be no more crying or pain. John paused as he stared in wonder at what he had just written down. All of these terrible things we've seen, people sick and hurt, being mocked and put in jail, all of it will be made right. Something else stood out to John. Light. There was so much light. The city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it. God's glory is its light. And the Lamb, Jesus, is its lamp. 
Its gates will never be shut because there will be no night there. The place John had seen wasn't just filled with light. It was beautiful too. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. It was as clear as crystal. It flowed from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. Its fruit was ripe every month. The leaves of the tree bring healing to the nations. Once again, John lifted his pen from the page. It just seemed impossible to share the real glory of what he had seen with tiny black marks on a scroll. He tried again. God's servants will serve him. They will see his face. John felt himself grinning. He could say one thing for sure, no one would be bored. He and every other person who believes in God would finally be able to live out what they were created to do fully and completely with no sin or frustration or weariness to get in the way. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Now, John didn't know exactly when the things God had shown him would take place, and neither do we. But from what we've seen and heard, we know one thing for certain. In the end, God will make everything right for those who trust in him. So John didn't know when the things that God showed him would take place. And the truth is, neither do we. But because of what we have seen and what we have heard, we can be sure of this, that in the end, God will make all things right for those who put their faith in Him. Now, it can be hard for us to understand John's vision. It's a bit confusing. And some of the things that even happen in our life, too, but we can be sure that God has a plan. And in the end, his story is good. It's so good. So the bottom line today is that following Jesus will turn out better than you can imagine. So my question for you today is, when you think of heaven, what are you most excited about?
Lord, as we gather in your name today, let our hearts be lifted to you. Let us behold the great things you have done and respond with lives of worship and service offered to you. And as the psalmist prayed in Psalm 25, Lord, we also pray, show us the right path, Lord. Point out the way for us to follow. Lead us by your truth and teach us, for you are the God who saves. We put our hope in you today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Spirit, we pray. Amen. Well, let us worship God together.
say my song remains God you Joy of our salvation, and 
renew a right spirit within me. As we continue, would you read and pray along with us these words from Psalm 51? Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion against you, and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. God of my salvation. God of my salvation. Open my mouth and my lips will declare your Humble me, Lord, give me a contrite heart And renew a right spirit within me And renew a right spirit within me For our prayer time at the service, I want to use the acrostic acts, A-C-T-S. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's just a great way to wander through and guide your prayers. Uh, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, acts. And I want to use four psalms uh, to guide our journey. So would you join with me in prayer? I want to read Psalm 134 to guide us in adoration. Psalm 134. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. And God, we pause and we reflect and we do desire to praise you and we do that right now. You are the God of heavens and the earth. Uh, you are the God who created all things. You are the God who sent Jesus to die for us, rise and ascend to heaven. And so we stop and we simply pause and we praise you for who you are at this service. For confession, I want to read Psalm 133. It says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were fa falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. But God, as we ponder and think about this, it says it's good when brothers live together in unity. And God, I simply want to stand here and confess where we are not living together in unity. Or the psalmist declares that you will bestow your blessing on those who live in unity. And so God, right now I confess, where among us there's friends who are not living in unity, they're separated. I confess, we confess that. We confess for marriages that aren't living in unity. We confess where brothers and sisters aren't living in unity. Or we confess where leaders choose not to live in unity. God, help us to reflect on our own lives in this time and knowing where we need to confess the lack of unity that we have in our lives. We bring that before you now. 
For the tea and Thanksgiving, I want to read Psalm 121. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. And God, we just thank you even right now that you watch over us, that you will not let us stumble. Lord, we just thank you for the many ways that you are enter into our lives. You give us insight, you give us guidance, you bring people at the right times to speak into our lives. And so we just give you praise and we thank you for these things. And may we continue to thank you on an ongoing basis for the beauty and all that you have given to us. And for the final, he asks the supplication, I want to read Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and his, in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And God, this time from the depths of our heart, we cry out to you. We wait for answers to prayers. God, we cry out to you for those in our community who are sick, who are feeling the physical pains of ailments, cancers, other diseases. Jesus, would you just come be present to them now? We pray for physical healing, but we also pray your peace upon their lives right now. For those who wrestle with issues of mental illness, for depression, for anxiety, Jesus, would you be present with them? Would you bring healing to their lives? We cry out to you. Lord, for those who have key decisions to make in the next while, Lord, we cry out to you on their behalf that you would bring them good guidance and leadership and discernment for decisions that would honor you in their lives. Lord, for marriages that are struggling, that are not being all they're called to be, Lord, we cry out to you. Would husband and wife choose to lean into each other, not pull apart? and find resolutions. And Lord, for our leaders, we cry out to you. For our elders who are leading North Park at this time, for the staff. And Lord, for those government officials, for our mayor, premier, prime minister, we cry out to you. Would you be near? Would you be present? We wait for you to bring these answers. So we thank you for this time. Amen and amen. Well, church, it's really good to be able to be with you again. I hope you've had an amazing week. Uh, this week has been a week of reflection for me. Uh, I've had to do, I get to do a lot of looking back over the last year. So it was this weekend, one year ago today, that we met as North Park Stratford for the very first time. We didn't have a building, we didn't have anything uh, happening. We're in the middle of a construction project here and God it was beginning to stir in people. And so what I wanted to do with you today is actually take a look over this past year, over some of the stuff that we did and experienced and see what you can remember and we will enjoy our time that way with an encouragement as well. So I just wanna say happy anniversary, North Park. Would you let me pray for us today? Heavenly Father, as we come before you as a people uh, scattered into our different homes today, we say thank you. We say thank you for that in this last year, we can see your hand moving amongst us. We can see your blessing upon us. We can see, God, that you wanted to do something beautiful and unique here. And so as we even look forward to the future, we just want to be reminiscent and say praise you, God, for the work that you've been doing. And so uh, would you lift our hearts to you even as we would reminisce over the things that we have been doing together as North Park Stratford. So we pray your Holy Spirit to be with us in this time in the name of Christ. And all God's people everywhere said, amen and amen. Well, Church, like I said, it's been a fantastic year. And this story of North Park Stratford 
starts before the anniversary of this weekend, before a year ago today. It started in two places that came together to become one. It started when a group of people here in Stratford that attended a church called Cornerstone Bible Fellowship wanted to uh, gather together. Uh, they were worshiping God, but they were seeing that their numbers were dwindling. They were seeing that uh, they had lost their ability of impacting the neighborhood and the young families had left. So you have that group. And then on the other side, you have a church in London, large and thriving, a little over 1,500 people who had a dream and a vision from God to be a church that's willing to plant churches, in particular in older spaces like we are. And so the church in London, after uh, an amazing thing where they had this building opportunity in the city of London, uh, they were in the middle of a massive campaign for their own building, and an opportunity came up to purchase the Huron site. And it would have cost them another 300000 and they said, we couldn't do it. But then the elders prayed about it, and they said, this is an opportunity God is giving us. So they went back to the congregation, and immediately they were able to raise half of the money, 150000 as well as very soon after that, they were able to raise the rest. And they bought the first site in, on Huron Street in uh, London. And it functioned as a ministry center for a little while, and then it became a church that uh, Shane Sims, who was the uh, pastor of adult discipleship at the time, he ended up being the pastor of the site. And as God worked in them, the church got really excited. They saw the life that it brought them as a church in Fanshawe to be able to do this work of church planting. So they kind of made a resolution to say that if an opportunity came that they felt like the Holy Spirit was leading in them, and it was within a one-hour drive of London and was financially feasible for them to do that, they would look at uh, doing this process again. We have that group then meets the Stratford group, this group of people that in leadership said, we need somebody to come and take us over. We, we can't sustain what we're doing. And so they began that conversation and uh, North Park heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, and they said yes. And so uh, Cornerstone turned over the building, North Park paid off the mortgage, and we did a renovation, and we planned to open for services September of 2019, which is what we did. This has been an amazing story, an amazing journey, and I thought it'd be fun to look back at it. Uh, some of you who were a part of Cornerstone uh, will remember it back when it used to look more like this. This here is a picture of the sanctuary from the top of the stairs that go up towards the what we call the coffee bar now. That's the coffee bar area right here. Uh, they were using it for storage for chairs, and there were some cabinets, and that was about it. And then uh, the soundboard was down in the corner, and you can see here we had pews. Now, the pews on this side of the room were far larger than the pews on this side. They were much shorter. Uh, it wasn't a center aisle with this kind of purple-red carpet here and up on the stage. Giant old podium. Uh, this here, this was originally a Lutheran church, actually. So right here, they used to have a lectern area where, a, uh, when it was a Lutheran church, the pastor would come up and preach from up there and the cross and, and all that. So that was it. And then we had in the basement, we had this beautiful green carpet, um, which was amazing, and uh, some tables and some chairs open and walls that were portable and those fluorescent lights. And this was a church that uh, they didn't have any more kids. Uh, they were using it as they did, and uh, it worked for them. It worked for them, but it wasn't a church that was growing and thriving. Well, not everybody will be able to maybe recognize it even now, but this is a picture from today of our sanctuary where I am right now. Normally we have all of our black chairs out, uh, but you can see we've repainted, recarpeted, built the stairs. We kept the cross uh, as a way to honor and remember those that were part of Cornerstone, uh, put new lighting behind it and put this beautiful brown feature wall that matches the roof. Uh, the screen, and for some of you who haven't been here for a while, this screen has actually been moved and raised from last time we were together in person uh, to make it easier for the day that we eventually get to come back. Uh, we painted everything. We built this coffee area, which was a complete change from what it used to be, uh, with new flooring and paint and coffee area and the bar, which is in a different photo. 
And then we have our downstairs area where we built a couple of classrooms, new paint, carpet, uh, all that sort of stuff, did a washroom renovation. Uh, we just put a, a lot of love into this building to make it something that would be a wonderful place for families to come and experience the love and the grace of Jesus Christ in our family. And so that's kind of some of the shifting that we've had. These here are some pictures from our very first gathering. This was one year ago this weekend where a group of people who really wanted to explore what it would be like to become part of uh, North Park Stratford would gather together. Uh, we worshipped. We talked a little bit about vision, about where we were going. Uh, at this stage here, the washroom didn't even work properly. We didn't have a sink. They took the sink out two days before and didn't tell me. Um, and so, um, but we were still able to use the building. And this was my, my daughter's here in the first picture. She, this was her first time ever to Ontario. They, her and Abby came out just for this weekend uh, to meet everybody. It was just an amazing time. And there was about 60 of us that gathered together, 60, 62, that gathered together to begin exploring what does this look like, to pray together. Well, it wasn't long after that we began adding our staff, right? Uh, we added Jordan Berta as a pastoral resident. We have this one-year contract with him to give him some education and some uh, opportunities to grow in his, uh, not only his faith, but in his pastoral skills with us at North Park. And uh, I realized I actually don't have a lot of pictures of Jordan. I think it's because he's always behind the scenes doing a lot of great work. Um, but we got him up here leading worship. And this picture here is very much our staff. Uh, it's me trying to be cool and failing miserable. Pam, ready to go, absolutely driven, and is very, very strong and powerful. And Jordan going, what's going on? Uh, a little bit with us, especially at the beginning when we took this. Uh, this encapsulated, we laughed as a staff because we thought this encapsulated us very well uh, for the three of us. So Jordan was our first hire, and uh, he even came out to our, week, uh, our weekend together before he was even on staff just to check it out. Well, our next hire was Pam, right? Our youth pastor, first permanent um, employee, part-time for now. And uh, this is what she usually looks like. Well, okay, this is what she thinks she usually looks like. More often than not, I think she ends up looking like this. Uh, she's doing an amazing job with our youth and with our kids' ministry. She's putting herself out there, letting herself have a ton of fun, uh, and working at building and discipling into our kids' lives. And I'm just so blessed. And I just want to kind of publicly thank um, Jordan for his amazing work on an administration of this church and Pam we couldn't launch this church without them and we are so excited for uh, what God has in the future for all of us as we continue on this journey of faith and so we're just uh, very grateful for that well, these are actually here, some amazing pictures. We had this great first weekend. One of our elders from our church, Tim Grigg, came out and led worship uh, with Jordan. It was this beautiful time. The church was packed, right? There was like 150 people, I think, that day. Uh, and we had our kids' ministry going. And that was happening really for the beginning, for the first time in a while. Uh, we had kids coming back to our church. And we love having them here. We love having our kids. And so it's just been a fantastic experience. And I miss seeing them all run around uh, now that we're kind of doing church online. And so excited to see what God is continuing to do here. But these were exciting days, the beginning of this series that we did here. Uh, we began to having some potlucks downstairs, right? Enjoying eating together and getting to know each other as a church, right? We loved having our kids uh, participate on stage and leading us in songs and games and having fun. We even did a family event where we went down to St. Mary's and went tubing, which was a great time. And if you didn't get a chance to join us, uh, hopefully we're going to do this again and you'll come out next time because uh, that was a, just a ton of fun. My family had a great time. Well, we did a bunch of teaching series. That's one of my major roles here. We looked through a bunch of different sermon series. In fact, all of the different series we had are up here on the screen. And I'm going to give you a second to take a look at them all. Because here's a little game for you. I want to see, can you at home put them in the correct order, starting from the first series we did to the most recent? Okay, you get about a couple of seconds. If you want to pause and take a look, you can. But see if you can put those in order. Did you get them? 
Okay, well, let's find out, because here's the order that, they, uh, that we did these series in. The first one we did was called Starting Over, right? We began to look at this idea of beginning a new church here. Uh, we then looked at myths and misunderstandings, common things not found in the Bible. After that, it became Christmas time. It was Advent. So we did Christmas, uh, the characters of Christmas, and we had our first Christmas Eve service, which we had about 100 people at, and it was beautiful. Then Jordan led us for a couple of weeks in the book of Philemon, which I thought he did an excellent job on. In January of 2020, we started a series called Anchored in the book of Hebrews, and we followed along the track set out by Fanshawe on that one. After that was done, we moved into the parables, and we went in the parables right up into Easter, uh, which that was the beginning of COVID, was in the middle of the parable series, uh, about two or three weeks in. After that, we went into our series called Stronger, where for eight weeks we looked at some of the spiritual disciplines to help you get stronger in your faith. And then most recently, Stories, where Pam, Jordan, and I, we shared some of our faith story so that you could get us to know us better uh, as leaders in your church. So how many of you got those all right in the right order? We'll see. Just to make you feel better if you didn't, when I asked Abby, my wife, this, she didn't get them all right at this, uh, uh, either. So don't worry about it if you didn't get it, but it was fun. But you know, a church, we want to create great church worship experiences. It's the thing I'm most passionate, if I'm going to be honest with you, right, is to create a church experience where you'd never be embarrassed for somebody who didn't believe to be Come part of us to explore faith with us, and that was always my heart. That they would people, somebody who didn't believe, would come here and feel very comfortable, uh, would feel loved, and would be able to engage with our faith story um, as they journey along. Too, that's always been my passion. But we also know a church does not only exist on Sunday. A church is a church. It, it always exists. We, the church, are the people of God, and we just meet on a Sunday to worship. But we also do other things too. And we believe at North Park in the core value of generosity. And so we decided to, we wanted to partner with some uh, community organizations. And so just before COVID started, before we even had a hint of it really, we started doing a fundraiser of getting gift cards to help uh, combat youth homelessness here in Stratford with this organization, Stratford Perth Shelter Link. And your generosity allowed us to raise $1,100 in gift cards, which we were able to take to them and bless them. Well, we didn't want to do just that, because once you get a taste for helping people, it's something you want to keep doing. So we ended up doing a baking challenge for Cedar Croft. Here, we did a baking challenge. And in case anybody looks carefully at these photos, this is not one of the actual photos. This is the actual photo of some of our gift cards. This one is not, this is a stock photo I stole from the internet because on this one I just did videos on Instagram and they are very hard to pull off to put on a PowerPoint here. And so, uh, but we blessed Cedarcroft Place, a senior's home uh, that was on deep lockdown and we were able to bless them with letters, with notes and with our baked goods. And then finally, we did a toiletry roundup for one of our strategic partners, the House of Blessing, which is the local food bank here in Stratford. And we uh, were able to raise like boxes and boxes of things in order to help them because they said they were running low on toiletries. But then after that, our elders at North Park in London looked at the budget and said, even though we are not receiving as much money during COVID as we were uh, hoping to, or we were expecting, we are still called to be generous. And so uh, out of the North Park Go Fund, uh, we were able to donate another $5,000 to the House of Blessing to help with their operating costs. And so we want to, we are blessed to be a blessing. And we're so excited to be able to partner with some of these strategic places here in Stratford in order to help them further their mission of making Stratford a great place to be. You see, we're for the city here in our church. We're for the betterment of our city. And so we're going to do what it takes in order to help uh, our city out. And so these are some of the things that we've been doing. But this year, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about kind of the shattering of everything we knew with the COVID pandemic, where we had to stop doing in-person services and move online. And it was a little bumpy. It took us a little while to find our rhythm of how we wanted to present everything. And I think we're still working on it, to tell the truth. But we're getting closer and closer every day to producing for you the online content that we hope is helping you in your faith. 
but it has been a massive shift. And everybody I talk to from our church misses gathering together. And I want you to know, church, I miss you. I miss gathering with you as well. It's nice to have weekends off. <laughs> I have to admit that. Um, and I also have to admit that my preaching has an extra level of faith to it. Because I don't know how or if you're even going to receive this or whether or not you're going to just watch some celebrity pastor online. But I have been grateful for all of you that are continuing to press in with what God wants to do through North Park even during this COVID time. A lot of this mission pieces that we did about living on mission are happening during COVID. The blessing for the seniors home, the helping out of the um, North Park uh, House of Blessing, as well as even the donating of the gift cards. We did that. In the, uh, we took, started it at the beginning, but we delivered them in the middle of the COVID crisis. Because now is the time when our city needs our help the most. Now is the time when we need to rally together not in some way that says, you know, we're in this together like we're going to buy a car as I see in the ads, but a true sense that we are the people of God who are in ministry together to promote the welfare of our city and reach people with the good news of Jesus. And so we're continuing trying to find ways of being able to do that. We still want to help people grow in their faith, and we want to help people enjoy what they're experiencing through our online services. And so um, we are now on YouTube, I'm sure, because that's where you are. And if you haven't yet, it would help us out a lot if you would subscribe. Um, subscribe with as many of your email accounts as you can. And the reason is, is we'll be able to get a customizable URL, which will be, help us in our um, branding stuff uh, when we promote. And so if you could find North Park Stratford on YouTube and subscribe, that would be super helpful. But it's been a massive shift. And there's something special about, about gathering in person. And I think we all recognize that. But I also want us to recognize the great opportunity that is before us right now. The great opportunity to be a people who live missionally. A great opportunity for a people who says our God is not confined into this space on one day a week, but is with us all the time. He's with us in our homes as we parent our kids, as we love our spouses, as we watch TV, as we interact with our friends. And when we go to work, he is our God who is inspiring us and moving into us. And he is doing this great work through us in order to help people. And so I want us to look at what we're doing here as an opportunity, not as a fallback, right? We are not less of a church because we have not gathered together. We are a people on fire for, the, for Jesus who saved us because of his great sacrifice. And it is that fire that is going to propel us into action in order to reveal the love of God to our neighbors and to our families and to our friends, to our coworkers. And so I'm hoping and trusting the Holy Spirit is working in you, helping you live out the Christian faith in a completely different way. And we're excited to hear stories about that, stories of people who are uh, now taking more responsibility for the spiritual education of their children, people that are taking more responsibility for their own spiritual well-being instead of depending on the church to feed them on one day a week now they're starting to take more responsibility in getting into the scriptures and praying and reading and asking questions on their own and it's been beautiful to watch you know as i look upon this year we had six months where we gathered together january or sorry i should say september through about the first two weeks of march now we've had about six months almost online. And uh, it won't be long. We've been online church longer than we'll have been an in-person church. But God is good. One day, when it is safe, we will gather again. One day, when we can guarantee all of your safety, we will come and we will gather in worship together in one spot. And my hope is, is then that time, we're going to be surprised because God will have been working in some people's lives, and some people we didn't know were going to come and join our new church family. Even as others who began this journey with us have found, you know what, it's time for me to make a change. 
And I understand that. And I bless that. And that's totally fine. But there's something here that I think is so important for us to recognize. And that is this. No matter what we're going through as a church, no matter what this past year had been, there's a fundamental truth that we have to cling to. And that's this. God is in control. God is in control. He is in control. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear for what's going on in the world because we have a God who is in control, who knows what's going on, and in fact is doing something pretty amazing. Let's look at this scripture here from the book of Isaiah. Now, this is an uh, oracle actually written originally to King Cyrus of Persia, um, but I think there's some amazing principles in here for you and I in our faith walk as well. The Lord says in this oracle, I am the Lord, the end of chap uh, verse uh, 6 in chapter 45. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and I create darkness calamity. I am the Lord who does these things, right? The ancient Israelites had no problem understanding their world as something that everything in it was from the hand of God. The good things they experienced and the terrible things they experienced. That the Babylonian um, persecution of Israel, where they kidnapped them and brought them back to Babylon, that was actually God's plan in order to do something with Israel. They were okay with it. They had a very high view of God's sovereignty. Today, we arrogantly think that God has to answer to our view of what is right and wrong. And so we often try to explain things like this away. I'm not saying one thing is or isn't what God is doing. All I'm saying is in this scripture, it literally says that God creates calamity, that God does these things. Why? Because God is the one who's in control. And that means that you don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to be afraid that your church isn't going to be your church. We're still going to be here for you. We still want to help you in your walk with Jesus, and we want to empower you to be a blessing to other people. We're still going to be here because our God is in control. You don't have to worry about your finances. You don't have to worry and be anxious about your kids and the kind of world they're growing up with. You don't have to worry. Even though it'll be different than the world we've experienced so far, it is the Lord. He makes it happen. He is the one who is in control. And what we need to do is therefore just trust in him. What we need to do is rest in him. What we need to do is say, God, in the middle of this mess of a life that I know I don't understand, God, you are in control and I trust you. That's the prayer of faith that the people of God get to pray right now. Other people can be consumed with the worry we don't have to be because we've got a God who's in control, the one true living God. But I think there's something else. In addition to God is in control, I also want us to know that God is going to do what God wants to do. That part of God being in control is God is going to enact his will. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. And what does God want to do? Well, look at the next verse here in Isaiah 45. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. What does God want to do? God wants to bring about righteousness. He wants us to be walking in that right relationship with him, knowing him deeper, getting closer with him, living out his principles with more passion, with more zeal, with more authenticity, with more consistency. God wants us to have this righteousness. He wants it to rain down upon us, and he wants that salvation would come. In this 
context, it is for the Israelites from the hand of Babylon. But for you and I, the salvation he wants to bring is from the oppression of sin in our lives, the oppression of that which keeps us from knowing God better, from keeps us from living his life out better. God wants us to be saved from that, from all the things that would hinder us, that would entangle us, that would keep us from having the life that God has invited us into, the eternal life, the spiritual life, the full life of John 10.10. 10. He wants us to uh, experience salvation from everything that tries to take that away from us so that we can experience peace, so that we can experience love, so that we can experience joy so we can experience goodness and we can experience kindness and we can experience gentleness and we can experience faithfulness and we can experience self-control right so we can experience what god calls the fruit of the spirit in galatians chapter 5 right chapter verses 22 you should check out that verse god wants us to live that out by the holy spirit Spirit that comes in us when we receive Jesus as our Savior. What's God doing during COVID? He's bringing righteousness and He's bringing salvation into your life and into our world. You see, lots of churches, I'm hearing stories of people that were hearts were hard against God and during COVID have come deeper into knowing Him. Their hearts were against God or they've chosen to follow Jesus for the first time, and to see their lives beginning to change. Right? God is at work. He is in control, and he's doing what he wants to do, which is bringing righteousness and bringing salvation to you and to me. He wants to bring salvation and righteousness to you and to me. It makes me want to ask this question. What is God doing in your life lately? What's God doing? Is he bringing his righteousness and his salvation to you? Salvation from all these things that keep us from knowing him? It's his plan. That's his plan. That's what he wants to do. But he also gave us this thing called free will. So God's in control, and we have free will. We hold these two truths in tension with each other. But that free will sometimes means we don't want to receive the righteousness. Sometimes we don't want to receive the salvation, even though it would be better for us. But as I look back over the last year, I see God doing some amazing things. I see God transforming some lives through the Word of God, through the people here at North Park Stratford. I definitely see God changing some stuff in my life. He is changing me as a person, He's helping me to grow. And for every one of you who've been part of that, thank you. Today would be a good day for you to answer this question in a journal or in a conversation with somebody. What's God doing in your life lately? I think it brings another question too. You see, God doesn't just come so that we would be people who receive. He came so we would receive salvation so that we would actually become something. We would become his body. We would become his hands, his feet. That we would participate with him in the redemptive work in humanity. Not that God is saved, or not that anybody, I should say, is saved by our efforts. It's only by the Spirit of God. But God uses us to reveal himself to other people. So let me ask you this question. How will you, how will you participate in God's redemptive story? How will you participate in God's redemptive work? What are you going to do? How are you going to work with God under the power of the Holy Spirit as a blessed child of God? How are you going to participate in God's redemptive work in other people's lives? What will you do about it? 
Because just because church isn't happening on a Sunday morning in person in a location doesn't mean the kingdom of God has been turned off or that the kingdom of God is on holiday or that we are are on pause. No, no, we press forward using the mediums that God has given us, which this case is online for now, that in order to continue to help people grow in their relationship with God, to experience God's redemptive work. How will you participate? How will you participate in God's redemptive work? You know, ministry, when we were in person, required a lot of volunteers. And now that we've moved like this, I'll be honest, it's taking less volunteers. But we want to change that. We want you to come alongside and we together as one church family participate in God's redemptive work here in the city of Stratford. So I'd love for you to reach out to me. My email address is here below. You can see it, and we would love to participate. Kirk.Earhart at northpark.ca. If you want to work with us on an organizational level about how we can participate in God's redemptive work, I invite you to send me an email. Because what I'd like to do is I'd like to gather a few people and socially distance, meet in person, and begin praying over our city and, in, and brainstorming of how are we going to make a positive reach with the good news of Jesus. We want you to be part of that. Pam is doing amazing work with our teens and with our kids. She could use some people to come alongside of her, to volunteer, maybe even teach an online lesson. Uh, and, and to participate in the discipleship of our young people and in reaching new young people with the good news of Jesus. So I invite you to reach out to her. Same type of email. It's pam.weidman at northpark.ca. And so we want you to reach out to us and participate with us so that we can follow what God calls us to, which is to participate in God's redemptive work. Well, I want to take a couple of minutes as we close up here, uh, and I'm hoping that this has been an encouraging time for you uh, to talk about the future a little bit. Our next teaching series is this one here. It's called Selfless. There's a lot of statements in the Bible that are about the one another's, that we are called to bless one another and serve one another and care for one another. And there's actually like 50 something of them, 59 of them, I think. We're going to look at some of them through the month of August. And I'm very excited because... You see, Jesus, when he came, he said that himself, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, right, in Mark chapter 12. And so therefore, we are going to be like, we want to be like that too. That we don't want to be people who are just served, people that are simply uh, consumers in life of everything, but we actually want to be producers. We want to serve other people. And so we're going to look at this countercultural way of living that is others-oriented that Jesus models for us. So we invite you to come and check that out. That's going to be, I think, an enjoyable series. Next thing we're going to look at is we're going to do something kind of uh, hopefully good. I'm excited about this one. We're going to do a Bible study on Ephesians. And in the book of Ephesians, there's a great um, principles there about who we are in Christ and how we're going to live it out. And the book is beautifully divided. Kind of chapters 1 through 3 talk about who we are. 4, 5, 6 talk about how we live it out. And so we want to journey through that through um, at least four weeks, maybe six weeks, um, starting on Tuesday, August 4th. And here's what we're going to do with that. We're going to have that as an in-person Bible study where there will be social distancing. You'll have to wear masks in and out and moving around the building. Uh, You'll have to do proper sanitation and do social distance, of course. Uh, but we're going to be able to do that one in person here in our church. Then what we're also going to do is for those that want love to participate but are not ready to um, be out in public or are not uh, able to for whatever reasons, want to do another time, I'm going to actually be recording some teaching videos to go alongside of these that will be short, that will be available in YouTube on our YouTube page. And the booklet that we will all work through will be available for you to download as well. And so that's coming up in August, and I'm really excited about doing that. Uh, We're starting to get people to register. So if you go to our website, if you go to northpark.ca, uh, on Stratford, you'll see a link, uh, northpark.ca slash Stratford, you'll see a link for this. 
and it will take you to the registration page. And I would love it if you would register for that event, um, especially in COVID. We got to keep good track of who's here uh, in case something does happen. Um, but we want us to be able to begin in small ways, figuring out how we can uh, meet together for a little bit of distance fellowship and teaching in the Word of God. So that's coming up. I encourage you to register that at northpark.ca. And then in September, we're going to start uh, in September with a series called Church History 101. And we're going to look through like four, five major issue um, moments in the church history time frame uh, over the last couple thousand years. It's going to be super brief, and there are going to be lessons we can learn from it. You know, a lot of Christians today were pretty ignorant of our own church history. We don't know that much about it. And so we're going to do a little bit of a study on that. And so I'm excited for this series. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of great things to learn from it. It will not be a boring history lecture. This will be saying, here's some of the key events in history and some amazing principles for you and I to learn to live out here and now. So this is going to be real practical for your life. So I'm excited about this series. Church, this year has been an absolutely amazing year. It's been a year nobody could predict. When I was living in Calgary, I, before I took this job, there was no way I would predict that not only would I move across the country uh, to Ontario, I never wanted to move to Ontario, but hey, God moves. Uh, I would not have predicted that. I'd be here in Ontario and that after six months of planning a church, We'd have to move it to online. Could never predict that. I'm still learning in this, and I'm still hopefully going to get better at it. And I pray for your patience as we figure these things out. But mostly, I want you to know that even though we can't always predict the future, we don't know what's going to happen, just as I couldn't know what was going to happen coming here, we don't have to be afraid of it because our God is in control. And he invites us to recognize his work in our life and to participate with him in his redemptive work that brings salvation and righteousness down from heaven to earth. Church, I want to thank you for being part of this family. My heart is encouraged. Even when I just see that there are a few people that have checked out our videos online, my heart is encouraged. Uh, because I believe then that God is taking these words and is impacting them, uh, using the impact in your life. And so thank you. Thank you for your generosity, for your financial giving. And uh, if you want more information on how to do that, if you haven't been or you'd like to increase, uh, we would welcome your sacrifice to God that way. And you can go to northpark.ca slash give, and you can uh, find out how you can do that there. As always, Thanks for everything. You are an amazing church. Know that even if we haven't been in a lot of contact, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you, and know that you are loved. Not only by me and by my family, but by our everlasting, eternal God who is for you, who is not against you, who loves you so much he sent his son to die on a cross for you, and through that, offers you salvation and righteousness if you would just receive him. Please join us in singing as we prepare to go to the Lord's table.
washes white as participating with us in the service. Today we are celebrating communion. I'm Dennis Ensing, one of the elders here at North Park. Welcome to our home. Together with my wife, Debbie, we are delighted to share in this communion celebration with you. Just a last reminder to hit pause if you haven't yet collected your elements to share in this part of the service with us. During this time, we remember that Jesus Christ gave his life on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, our redemption and our reconciliation into a good relationship with God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to join with us today as we express our faith in him, no matter what your Christian tradition is. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, please know we are glad to have you with us today and invite you to continue listening. But please contact the church office if you do desire reconciliation with God. Finally, parents, it's up to you how your children should partake with you today. Before we take the communion elements, we wanted to share a few thoughts from the Word on peace. Through the last few months of COVID and all the isolation, one of the things that I've prayed most for our family and for our loved ones is that they would find the peace of Christ in the midst of the storm. And we also pray that for you as well. As you reflect now on Christ's suffering and his sacrifice and his great love for you, that you would be able to turn your heart and find the peace that only he offers. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take our heart, I have overcome the world. And in Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven, Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul lays out for us the institution of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. For I have received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, at the Last Supper, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Please pray with us. Jesus, as we take this bread, let it be a sign of all you did for us and who you are for us. Thank you for this bread of life. The body of Christ broken for us. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. Please pray with us. Jesus, as we drink this cup, let it be a sign for us, for all that you have done for us and who you are for us. Thank you also that you bring us peace that passes all understanding. Please drink the juice at this time. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you. Let's pray with thanksgiving for what God has done. Jesus, through your death and resurrection, you reconciled the world to God. And through your example, you have shown us a way to peace. Give us strength as the people of God to be channels of your peace in the world. Speaking your peace, living your peace, and always longing for that moment of eternal peace when we shall see you again. Amen. We wanted to leave you with 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Please join us in singing as we close. I 
I will be yours for all my life And I will be yours, oh I will be yours for all my life our week being open to the Lord changing us from the inside. God's grace and peace go with you. Follow his leading as you go.